Could the definitive Leviathan of prehistory survive the alien waters of Subnautica? Livyaton Melvili is an ancient apex predator with a heck of a reputation, named after both a biblical sea monster and the author of the novel Moby Dick. It was a huge, hypercarnivorous relative of the modern sperm whale with teeth a foot long, and it specialized in hunting sharks along with other whales. We'll be putting Livyaton into an ocean of other leviathans, planet 4546b, specifically Sector 0 by the North Pole. Let's watch how it can navigate the icy water of its new home, adapt to the alien prey to satisfy its hunger, and compete with the hangar of native threats. We'll even discuss the possible descendants of a successful Livyaton population, integrating them into the Subnautica game system like we've done in the past. Let's dive in. In order to understand how Livyaton will interact with the xenoecology of Sector Zero, we need to know the basics about the Leviathan of Leviathans itself. Discovered in 2008 in a desert by the coast of Peru, Livyaton lived 9 to 10 million years ago during the Miocene Epoch. It coexisted with the enormous megatooth shark Otodus megalodon and was roughly comparable in overall size. Of course, that's based on the single decent specimen of Livyaton that we have, given how it's only known from the holotype skull and various isolated teeth. Body length estimates based on more complete relatives indicate a size range of 13.5 to 17.5 meters for the holotype specimen, with corresponding masses between 26 and 57 tons. For the sake of simplicity for the video, we'll see a typical adult Livyaton is 15 meters long and 36 tons, a nice middle ground. As a large, open water hunter, Livyaton most likely focused on hunting prey close to the surface. It was proposed in its description paper to hunt similarly to a gigantic orca, ripping into medium-sized whales with its foot-long teeth and swallowing large chunks of meat at a time. While formal bite force estimates for this animal are not currently found in the scientific literature, I'm sure it would have been able to gouge through bone by virtue of the huge areas for muscle attachments on the sides of its car-sized skull. It may have utilized a form of sonar like modern sperm whales, generating loud clicks and listening carefully to find its prey in the vastness of the ocean. Livyaton probably jammed out to epic hunting music either way, and fossil evidence indicates that they used Raycon earbuds to do it. This message is sponsored by Raycon. If you're looking for a perfect earbud upgrade, I've been using Raycon's Essential Open Earbuds, and honestly, they're so good. I love that I can play my music and still hear what's going on around me. It's perfect for the gym or when I'm out walking. Regular earbuds block out everything. You can't hear someone calling your name, a car honking, a leviathan proximity warning, anything. These Raycon earbuds sit just outside your ear canal, so you get crystal clear sound but you can actually hear what's happening around you too. They're really light and the ear hook part rotates so they actually stay in when you're on the go. You can wear them at the gym, on walks, writing videos and novels, doing stuff around the house. They don't fall out and they don't get uncomfortable. Raycon has over 3 million customers and the sound quality is just as good as the way more expensive brands. They're half the price because they're not paying for celebrity endorsements and all that retail markup stuff. And if you don't like them, they have a 30 day guarantee. They even have a crazy 36 hours of battery life. That's 8 hours of consecutive playtime and 36 hours of battery with the charging case. I charge them maybe once a week. The essential open earbuds are here and they're selling fast. Just click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash vivid and open to save up to 20% site wide during the new year's sale on Raycon audio products. I don't anticipate the temperature of Sector Zero being a significant issue for Liviaton. Modern sperm whales hunt and live just fine in polar waters by Greenland and Iceland after all. So let's take a look at the very first biome the shallow twisty bridges, which has a maximum depth of 40 meters. There are indeed bridges, and they are indeed twisty. Coral formations cover this biome like an underwater game of snakes and ladders, forming great protective areas for small animals and the player. Those small animals include arctic peepers, bladderfish, holefish, and boomerangs. For most predators, that's enough to stay happily fed, but Livyaton, as an enormous carnivore, might only find the area useful as a youngling. The shallow twisty bridges could be worth revisiting to use as a temporary safe zone for Livyaton calves, but not much else. Let's move on by going deeper into the abyss. The deep twisty bridges are darker, more cramped, and far deeper than their early game relatives. The food items here are minuscule for the most part, with only squid sharks providing any sort of significant calories. Squid sharks are powerful predators in their own right, however, with sleek bodies and hook-like fangs that can flare out in an intimidating display. Given the cramped environment, Livyaton wouldn't consider it worth the irritation to try to hunt a squid shark down here. Back to the surface with the Arctic Kelp Forest. From sea level to 150 meters below is a very comfortable range for Livyaton, and there's much more room here to stretch your fins. The food availability is quite a bit more expansive than the deep twisty bridges as well, with classic dollar menu aliens like Arctic peepers and boomerangs. 
Panglings and panglings may bring out the inner orca in Livyton, providing tempting penguin-sized targets for eating and recreation. Pinnacarids are Sector Zero's answer to seals and sea lions, and while fast and agile, if you can catch one, it would be a great snack. Sea monkeys live in the kelp for the most part, and usually avoid the open areas that Livyton would be frequenting, but could supplement the invasive whale's diet on occasion. The issue with the kelp forest is that there's not a lot for the adults to eat, so we need to keep traveling to find the perfect biome. Again, this could be an adequate nursery area, like an alien super predator daycare. The sparse arctic in my estimation is not worth spending too much time in. It's a low sunlight, low productivity biome capped by ice sheets, making it relatively inhospitable for an air-breathing mammal that needs tremendous amounts of calories. Arctic peepers are too small to be worth hunting, brine wings can shoot freezing blasts that would cause severe pain to any potential predator, and penguins are fun to throw around, but not practical food unless you can get them in bulk. Titan holefish are the one thing the sparse arctic has got going for it, at least from a Liviaton's perspective. They're big enough to provide lots of energy, but give oxygen as an alternative function. Of course, if a Liviaton wanted to breathe, it could just swim to a biome that actually has available air. That's a better idea. The thermal spires are such a biome with a wide depth range of 5 to 280 meters below the surface. As the name implies, this region is full of hydrothermal vents that have built themselves higher and higher into geological towers rich with minerals and warm water. That supports several notable organisms, including arctic peepers, boomerangs, and featherfish, all of which would be snacks for weaned Liviaton young. Rock punchers are huge, shrimp-like crustacean aliens that disturb the seafloor with their powerful strikes to find rock grubs to eat. Their thick armor and violent blows keep them protected from the largest predators in the biome, Cryptosuchus. These crocodile-like, heavily armored hunters are slow, but their bites can do serious damage to the fish that they typically hunt. They're small enough that they wouldn't pose threats to Leviathan, especially accounting for the whale's parental care, but their spiky armor makes them a poor choice of meal. So while it's easier to breathe here, the food just isn't worth sticking around for. How about the iceberg zones? With one to the east and the other to the west, these biomes are rich with icy tunnels, pale blue glaciers, and caves, but there's plenty of open water areas as well. The west iceberg zone has a high biodiversity of aquatic species for young whales to chase, with classics like arctic peepers, bladderfish, boomerangs, penguins, and pinnacarids. Eye jellies may or may not be edible, and arctic rays appear to be highly toxic. Titan holefish are the largest prey items here, and there's enough surface oxygen that keeping them around to use as a breathing resource isn't worth not using them for meat. The East Iceberg Zone, however, will make Liviton giddy with joy. Its overall fauna profile is quite similar, with the addition of one piece of good news and one piece of bad news. Glow whales are the good news, and wow is Liviton excited to see some familiar looking buffet items. These slow, gentle giants are about 30 meters long, partially thanks to their elongated thin tails with most of their mass concentrated near their skulls. They travel alone or in pods, feeding on large shoals of fish. Their passive nature, lack of defenses, and slow movement make them ideal prey for a super predator that specialized in hunting other whales. Liviaton's foot-long teeth and enormous bite would be able to tear huge chunks out of their fins and sides, and it was likely far faster than glow whales could handle. This single food item alone would make the East Iceberg Zone the ideal home base, but we still need to discuss the bad news. A chelicerate makes its home in the East Iceberg Zone. This 40 meter super carnivore is covered in durable plate armor and is incredibly fast when it wants to be, taking out prey with 6 meter jaws that resemble those of Earth's camel spiders. Thanks to their size, firepower, and ridiculous armor, they are completely out of Liviton's league, and quite frankly, could ignore them or put them on its own menu. Fortunately, there's only one Chalice right here, and I think it likely that Liviton's echolocation would allow them to avoid the beast and feed it elsewhere in the biome. The lily pad islands at 0 to 340 meters provide both open water and localized miniature ecosystems in the form of floating rocks inside a vast water column. These rocks are host to various plants and small animals, kept afloat by their connection to huge lily pads that cover the polar water surface. There's enough space between the islands that Liviton would be able to obtain air without issue, and a huge array of delicious aliens. Bladderfish, boomerang, featherfish, hoopfish, newtfish, and sea monkeys make up the lower tier of prey animals, and in all honesty will go ignored most of the time. Brute sharks would find themselves frequent targets. Four to five meters long, brute sharks are admittedly successful mesopredators that wouldn't be much of a challenge to fast carnivores three times their length. Lily paddlers might not be targeted, depending on how their redirection hypnosis would affect Liviton. They're still vulnerable to ambushes at any rate. Squid sharks are another carnivore used to getting their own way that would find themselves potentially overpowered by the massive tank-built Liviton. To top it all off, glow whales can be found here. 
I'd argue that given the wider array of edible aliens and the lack of triglycerates, the lily pad islands are even better than the East Iceberg Zone. What other biomes are worth exploring? Perhaps the tree spires. They go deeper, at 70 to 460 meters. It's covered with hydrothermal coral, a beautiful life form that does indeed resemble a glowing underwater tree. While hoopfish and red featherfish live here, the Livyton's main focus would be on brute sharks. Vent garden leviathans can be found here, resembling living biomes of their own, along with two hungry chelicerates. Those powerful apex predators suddenly make the tree spires a lot less inviting, especially since they'd also be going after brute sharks. Let's move on for safety. The purple vents is our last biome we're examining. They're fairly shallow at 0 to 170 meters below the surface. As the name indicates, these rocky plateaus are covered in purple hydrothermal vents. Quite the creative name. Unfortunately, despite the wide swimming space, the purple vents offer very limited food. Bladderfish, which are more gristle than calories, crashfish, which blow up in your face if you get too close, and featherfish, which don't have anything wrong with them exactly, but just aren't big enough to sustain a population of 30-ton hypercarnivores. That's not their fault. Cryptosuchus are big enough to be worth eating, but it's the biological equivalent of putting exacto knives in your caramel apple. To top things off, a chelicerate roams the purple waters, although who knows what it even eats here. All in all, the purple vents get a P for please no, no thank you, really, I'm not interested. Now that we've covered the environment, menu, and competition, let's assign our Livyton population its thrive rate and life score. For home, it's a 6. They're perfectly capable of dealing with cold temperatures and the depths present in Sector 0, but that doesn't mean it's an ideal situation for them either. It's a bit cramped in most biomes, and their prey is deeper than they'd be used to. Speaking of prey, they get a 7 for hunger. Most biomes don't offer much that's worth specializing in, but the lily pad islands and East Iceberg Zone offer up glow whales along with middle-sized carnivores like brute sharks and squid sharks. Glow whales alone make it worth the trip to 4546B. As for hangar, Livyaton is mostly able to avoid the chelicerates, which are their only true threat in the surface biomes they're likely to frequent. Creatures like the Void Chelicerate and Shadow Leviathan are far beyond their ability to deal with, but live in areas that Livyaton either can't visit or doesn't want to. Brute sharks and squid sharks aren't threats so much as additional food items. We'll give them an 8, surprisingly their highest score of the three. That's an average Thrive Rate and Alive score of 7.0. Decent, but not spectacular, mainly brought down by the unfamiliar world with cramped environments and sparse food. Livyaton would settle into the lily pad islands and East Iceberg Zone as a powerful, fast, intelligent predator, specializing in hunting glow whales while avoiding the much stronger chelicerates. They wouldn't bother with most of the other biomes, given the relative lack of available calories to be found there. So how might Melville's Leviathan evolve? Not only to better succeed at its current niche, but to radiate outwards and become a dominant force in the game's greater ecosystem. Let's take a look at three potential variants that aim more towards animals that could actually be subnautica creatures, and then we'll discuss a Carnage Trench variant based on the horrifying might that the white whale represented in the original 1851 novel. First up is the Rumble Swarm. This 7 to 8 meter, 4 to 5 ton pack hunter is much lighter and faster than the original Livyaton. They travel in groups of 3 to 7 individuals in the kelp forest and both iceberg zones. Their overdeveloped cranial region hints at their devastating weapon, an ultrasonic blast that paralyzes their choice prey, pinacarids and brute sharks. They click and communicate with one another using evil sounding laughter that echoes in the water. Paralysis quickly follows, during which the rumble swarm will seize their prey and hurl them around like toys, biting off small pieces with each throw. They enjoy tossing pinacarids above the water and slapping them against ice flows before leaping up and grabbing them to finish the job. Rumble Swarms will attack the player unless you're in a prawn suit or larger vehicle, so the recommended course of action is to flee as soon as you hear their demonic laughter. The second is the Savage Blightfang. Blightfangs are larger than Rumble Swarms at 13 meters and 20 tons and are another cetacean that focused on speed. Their snouts are long but heavily reinforced, capable of dealing out serious impacts when they ram their prey, and their teeth are inspired by the prehistoric dolphin and Kyloriza. Blightfang specialize in hunting squid sharks, roaming the waters of the deep twisty bridges and lily pad islands. They hunt alone, lurking in deeper areas and marking their prey visually before blasting up from the deep and slamming their battering ram snouts into the squid shark's vulnerable belly. That impact often kills the squid shark immediately, allowing the Blightfang to tear apart the cephalopod-like alien with its enormous hooked teeth. They are not adverse to attacking sea trucks in a similar manner. Spear whales are not aggressive towards humans. At 5 meters long and 1500 kilograms, they're small enough that they focus their energy on hunting shoals of small fish. While their short, chubby faces are adorable, they hide a terrifying weapon. A projectile, too thick tongue that can fire up to 4 meters out of a spear whale's jaws, impaling fish and drawing them back almost instantly. 
They live in mated pairs that harass and crowd fish schools, forcing them into tight groups underneath ice flows or in tunnels before going to town with their spears. Spear whales are common in the iceberg zones, kelp forest, and sparse arctic, hunting the many species of small fish that call those biomes home. I like these guys. They're intelligent and make good traveling companions if you don't enjoy being surrounded by fish traffic, and have even led me to oxygen plants a few times in the past. The Scar Leviathan is not a good traveling companion. Not for all Terran explorers, anyway. Believed to have traveled to Sector Zero from the near-mythical Carnage Trench, the Scar Leviathan's behavior is erratic and illogical. We've never observed the monster eat anything, for one. Each encounter with the animal has proven its obsessive hatred of humanity, and ever since it arrived, our casualty rate has skyrocketed. Ruins of vehicles and bases litter Sector Zero, especially near the World Edge where it's been seen most frequently. Laser measurements taken from a distance indicate that this pale, sharp-toothed berserker is about 200 meters long, implying a mass well over 80,000 metric tons. It appears to have some method of sensing electromagnetic fields, an ability that allows it to track our operatives to their bases and wreak havoc. The name comes from the huge sucker-shaped scars on its body, believed to be the attempts of predation by another Carnage Trench native or some sort of monstrous victim fighting back against being devoured. You can check out the other episodes of this series to learn more about prehistoric creatures adapting to an alien world. If prehistory in general interests you, you might consider subscribing to learn more about the dinosaurs and other ancient life that I study. If you have additional suggestions for prehistoric animals and video game environments, let me know with a comment and I'll take a look. I appreciate all of your support in making these videos. Don't forget to click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash vividandopen to save up to 20% site-wide during the New Year's sale on Raycon audio products. I'm the Vividen, and I'll see you the next time aquatic super predators go ham on an alien planet.